so uh yeah i'm my my little talk will be about uh raft uh consensus uh and i've i've pretty much been learning this uh as a self interest i i work for a company called community doing elixir I've been doing elixir for almost three years uh and prior to that i did a bunch of blockchain cryptography stuff and that was one reason that I was interested in consensus algorithms. I'll, I'll briefly plug that in at some point uh, in my slides. But just as a summary, uh, I'll describe the raft algorithm based on the, the paper. And I have two examples. I hope I'll be able to go through both of them. The first one is a leader election that I implemented as I was going through the paper. And the second one is RabbitMQ's raw library, which is just a bit more mature. Uh, also disclaimer, I'm not really a uh, distributed systems expert. So this is just the stuff I learned. And Raft is touted as a very easy to understand consensus algorithm. So I guess we'll, we'll test this out right now. Uh, I always like to research where different uh, technologies or algorithms are used and raft is is pretty much out there when it comes to to distributed systems uh etcd for example uses it uh for key value replication if you use kubernetes that that's that's probably uh in your stack dgraph is a distributed graph database use a raft for replication rabbiting recently uh not recently actually uh, i don't know exactly when they released it i think it's in the last version uh, quorum queues, which are now uh, Raft state machines. Uh, CockroachDB, uh, Nevis is a very interesting one. It's a uh, Raft-based amnesia. And Kafka, this was last week. As I was researching for places where Raft is used, Kafka announced that they're going to replace Zookeeper with Raft, which is pretty crazy. Uh, Zookeeper was sort of a, an alternative uh, distributed consensus uh, to Raft. Um, all of these kind of fall into either uh, meta metadata replication. So for example, you want a, uh, a key value store of your servers and you, you want this to be uh, distributed across multiple nodes for uh, consistency and partition tolerance. Uh, shared configuration, database replication, that kind of stuff. Uh, well, this is one sentence definition. It's an algorithm for implementing a consistent partition tolerant distributed replicating state machine. Uh, and I'll dissect this as I go along. The main thing is the replicating state machine. So this is an application specific uh, construct. The simplest state machine is a function that that takes two arguments the first argument is uh the the new state and the previous argument is the the, the stored state so if you want to make an adder that, that would be the the simplest state machine for etcd for example it's a, a key value store uh, so uh, basically has two simple methods write and, and read um, if we add a, a Byzantine fault tolerance, then, then we get a blockchain basically. Like this definition is, is, is that plus Byzantine fault tolerance. And, and there's actually a project that, that uses that. Uh, cool. So let's go through leader election. Uh, these raft is basically a cluster of nodes and these nodes can, can be in one of the, those, those three states. All nodes start as followers uh, when they join the network. Uh, they become candidates only, I mean, two nodes could become candidates at the same time, but basically a candidate is a node that uh, other nodes will vote for, whether or not it becomes a leader. The leader, and there can only be one leader uh, in the cluster is, is the coordinator, basically. And what I'm showing here is the five nodes, let's say uh, an example of a, of a cluster. It could be three nodes. Um, I'll explain performance a bit later, but we're initializing each node with an election timeout. 
And this is because we don't want two nodes to, to basically reach the, the election at the same time. Uh, this happens, but that could cause split votes. So the first node that will, will time out, basically, which will be node one, will promote itself as a leader, as a candidate, sorry, and it will send uh, RPC requests to the other nodes. Sorry, was that, was that a question? All right. So this is, this is basically what happens when the, the timer runs out. Uh, sends the request, uh, obviously, I'll, I'll explain this, but this assumes that all these nodes are connected somehow. And, and that's, not a, that's not a subject of the paper, that's basically an implementation detail, but we're assuming these are connected via distributed uh, Erlang, basically. So we're sending RPC calls. Uh, the other nodes respond. The, the, uh, once the leader gets a majority of the votes, it will promote itself to, to leader. So here we can see I got five votes. Uh, and we have a concept of a term. This is just like a uh, real life election term. So we measure, uh, I think I have this in my next slide. So we measure the life of the cluster uh, in terms that increment. So for example, you can see here the first term, that's the amount of time, the, the blue box, the amount of time uh, it took for the uh, leader to get elected. Then we have normal operation where we're just receiving requests, replicating stuff. Uh, we get a second term if, the, if something happens to the leader uh, and we have to do a, another election. And then some more time elapses. T3, you can see there is a, uh, an election, but no emerging leader. That usually, that usually uh, happens when we have split, split votes. So two candidates uh, are promoting themselves at the same time, and they each get two votes, let's say. Uh, and what happens is because neither of those two gets a majority, there's no special thing in the algorithm. It just, they don't get promoted to leaders because they don't have a majority. And the election timeout will run out again. Uh, it will in get initialized to a random one. And then we repeat the process. So I'll get into this when we talk about performance because we want to know how fast we're converging towards a leader. That, that, that's actually, uh, as a side note, a problem with Zookeeper from, from what I heard. Uh, so just to summarize here, this is uh, the, the finite state machine of, of our system. I guess I didn't talk about a leader, for example, figuring out that its term, let's say the election term is lower than, than the other nodes. If it realizes that, then it will step down. Uh, the, the term could be lower if, let's say we have a, a network split and this leader is stuck in the net split that doesn't have a majority, the other the other split will actually elect successfully a leader and bump the term. Um, so that's how we get consistency. Basically, whatever this leader that's in the um, uh, net split, let's say with another, just another one node and they can't achieve majority, uh, it will step down. Cool. Uh, so this is the, the state machine part. Like I said, uh, this is a, this, the, this state machine is usually in memory and it's application specific. That's where our log gets applied to. Uh, and, and that's basically what we're storing. The log is usually persisted on disk because uh, if, we, if the node crashes, we wanna bootstrap it again. Uh, and as long as this log is consistent, and we don't have conflicts, we don't have other nodes with different data, then we're pretty much guaranteed that the state machine will also be uh, consistent. And there's these things uh, that I didn't really include in, in here, like log compaction. For example, this log can get huge. So what we do is just, we, we just timestamp uh, a current position of the log and we summarize, we basically, I guess reduce, I would call it, reduce the values. 
uh, and that's how we can deal with huge logs. Just checking my notes here. Uh, another aspect of writing to the log is when uh, only the leader can, can accept writes. Um, and if once, once the leader receives, let's say a request, it could be a write or add this, it um, adds it to its log, it doesn't commit it, it notifies all the other nodes, hey, I'm, I get this new value. Once the other nodes respond, the, once the majority respond that they acknowledged it, it commits the log, uh, applies it to the state machine, replies to the client, and then lets all the other nodes know that they should commit it also. Might be a different order there. I think it, it uh, lets all the other nodes uh, know that they should commit it before a response, but something like that. Uh, the, the idea is that uh, Raft is a, is a CP, uh, consistent and partition tolerant system. So when we say that it sacrifices availability for, uh, that it sacrifices availability for sensitivity and partition uh, tolerance, what that means is that uh, we could end up in a net split where a client that was talking to a leader uh, that is not the leader anymore will time out and will reject the request. So that basically puts the onus on clients to actually retry requests and um, it's a trade-off basically. I think I have a slide about that uh, in a few, in a couple ones. A uh, couple things about the log. Uh, we have indexes uh, for the logs just because uh, the leader uh, for like, we basically measure if a log matches based on the term and the index, because every single value we add to this log um, will, will, will be unique in that regard. Of course, we can have followers that maybe crashed, maybe stayed down for a long time, and then they just get back up. If you can see uh, the, uh, the third follower there just has values for index one and two. So the leaders, um, the leader's goal when it comes to the log is to force all the followers to follow its log. So uh, for example, here we have A to F followers and the, the leader that just got elected. Uh, the leader maintains the index of the next, uh, sorry, it maintains a, a log of the next index in its log. So once it gets elected, it will, uh, it will send the next index. It will, it will basically send its log to all the nodes. And those nodes will, will check like, am I matching? Am I matching what, what the leader is sending me? Okay, I'm not matching, I'm gonna reject this. So the leader decrements that next index. So it goes backwards and backwards in indexes until it finds an overlap. And then it deletes everything from then on it replaces it with the actual state. So again, um, we're, we're sacrificing losing some data to, to stay consistent. So if you, uh, I mean, it's, this is implementation specific, but if you're uh, sending requests and you're in the network partition, you should reject those requests if you're, if you're not, uh, if you don't have a majority as a leader. Cool. Uh, this is an example. Uh, for example, a follower might be down when the le leader commits a log entry. And then let's say this follower gets elected right away. If it will get elected right away because it has a, an inconsistent log of committed uh, entries, it will actually force the other nodes to, to delete whatever data they have and and match his. So the, the solution is that each node, uh, like the leader for, for that current term will have all the previous entries. So the system will not allow this follower to become a leader unless it's, it has a consistent log. So that's a nice, nice safety feature. The other thing is 
uh, if you if you've looked up uh, uh, logical clocks, uh, graph doesn't depend on on timing, so the system will stay consistent even if let's say requests take a long time. Uh, that will not affect uh, the consistency. It will affect availability because let's say uh, the majority of the nodes take too long, take longer than the election timeout to respond, then we'll get stuck in a loop where we don't have a leader and we're not able to take requests. Cool, yeah, this is very interesting. Performance um, is is important with, with a system like this that, that takes time to elect a leader. So uh, the two main important things is how long the, does the election converge and how, how long is the downtime if a leader crashes? They're kind of similar. But this is taken straight from the paper. Uh, at the top, we are, um, we're playing with the, uh, the election timeouts. So if you see, if you see uh, I can't actually see it because the chat window is in the way. But uh, when we have 50, 150, 150, that's basically the min max, right? So, so that means all the nodes start with the same timeout. It's 150. And as you can see it consistently at the top, it, it consistently takes more than 10 seconds. That's in, in uh, microseconds, I believe there. So if there's no randomization, then all those leaders will get split votes and they'll fight, fight for the votes. Uh, and the sweet spot is about 100, between 150 and 300 milliseconds. Uh, I believe that's the red line at, at the top. Uh, and you can see that even with a five millisecond uh, delay between the minimum and maximum uh, election timeout, we still get tenfold uh, increase in the, the speed of the uh, leader election. And at the bottom, we uh, at the bottom, we're reducing the minimum. So we're seeing like how low can we actually go with the with the uh, election timeout. The caveat here is that if we if we make it faster than the amount of time that the leader can send messages to all the nodes to request for the votes and for the round trip to, uh, to come back, then again, we're in trouble because we will never actually vote anybody. So the minimum that they tested is about 12, 12 to 24 milliseconds, but the paper recommends uh, 150 to 300 milliseconds. And that will give us about uh, 500 millisecond on average election timeout. So it's pretty quick. Uh, also, this is, this is just like distributed Erlang. Like the more nodes we have, the more back and forth traffic, you know, it's, it's really a, a mesh. So you, you won't see a hundred raft node clusters. Uh, they, like even the paper recommends up to nine nodes, five to nine. Uh, if you have an even number of nodes, it, it doesn't really matter because depending how, how, on how the network split happens, it will be the same as like, like say six would be the same as five in terms of uh, availability. Uh, but uh, that's something to keep in mind. So what projects do is they, they have little raft clusters. So let's say they would have, uh, even the raw library will see like, uh, it allows you to, to run multiple raft nodes. And then these raft nodes kind of coordinate with each other. So maybe like a raft within raft. Uh, I kind of talked about this, network partitions and Byzantine failures. Uh, we usually split it into an umbrella fail stop that includes everything from network cable being pulled to software hardware failures. And then there's the Byzantine failures, which are either, you know, a hacker breaking into your node and trying to send corrupted data or, you know, steal your Bitcoins or uh, software bugs, I guess, that, that could send, you know, gibberish data. That's probably very rare, but um, raft only deals with with fail stop type of errors. It doesn't it doesn't deal with Byzantine failures. Um, also, I kind of touched on this. So raft is an example of an asymmetric consensus where each 
request goes through the leader. Uh, that that's basically what would render it uh, unresponsive on an, uh, in a network split. Uh, the other example is symmetric consensus. This is not just consensus. Uh, this could be databases, for example. If we if we have a symmetric consensus, the 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 consistency problem becomes uh, like a in, indeterministic heuristic, like like the conflict free resolution or last writer wins. The CRDTs, I think, are used in Phoenix channels. But that's, that's basically, instead of relying on, on indexes in the log in terms to say, like, this is for sure what we committed, we have to, it's, it's a lot more complicated. Obviously, symmetric scales better. We can take requests on every single node, uh, but it comes with, with its own problems. Uh, here, again, kind of a reiteration. If we have three nodes uh, and one fails, we can still get the majority with two nodes. So it will we'll still operational. If we have five nodes in a cluster, two nodes can go down. We can still have majority. Uh, in that example on the right side there, you can see that the leader, D, fall, fell in a net split uh, with just one other node. So this leader will still stay leader because it will send uh, heartbeats to, to E and E will send back, you know, replies. Uh, the top, the top three, ABC, will form a leader uh, as well because they won't get any responses from D. Uh, one of them will actually get uh, into a candidate state, will get elected. Uh, the client though, so what, when you, the, what the RAF paper talks about the implementation is, says the client will send a request to a random node in the cluster. If that random node is the leader, it will respond and append and, and do whatever. If it's not, it will send back the address of the leader. It will say, hey, I can't help you, but here's the leader. You should repeat the request to, to the leader. And what, what could happen is the client can have, you know, the, the, the leader address. Let's say it's, it's a node, you know, uh, EPND node or a PID file. It could have the old, the old one, the, the one that's behind the net split. So in that case, that's why, again, we sacrifice uh, availability. We will get a timeout. We will get a bad response. But we're ensuring that we're staying consistent, right? If we were to write to the, the bottom net split, then reconciling it is, would be a nightmare um, in most cases. And we wouldn't be a CP. We wouldn't be a true... Uh, consistent and partition tolerant system. Uh, There's just another example of like a failure mode. For example, a leader can crash after committing a log, but before responding to the client. So this is a, a case of double double entry into the log. Uh, so usually the implement uh, the implementations uh, assign a unique ID, and we can check if that if we inserted that ID before. So as you can see, Raft is simple and it puts a bit of the responsibility on either clients or uh, the application to, to handle things that it doesn't want to handle. Um, this is my example. So uh, I did not know what I was doing when I was implementing this. So I thought, you know, we have a bunch of nodes, we have, we have the election timeout. So I thought this sounds like a process send after. So I'm gonna use that timeout. And I'm like, every node will start with this randomized election timeout. And once it reaches it, it will basically keep going into this loop, right? So we'll, we'll have like a node loop, we'll have a leader loop and, and so on. So uh, it's just a regular gen server. You can see I initialize the current term who I'm voting for election timeout, which is random. The heartbeat is a flag to, to say like, did I receive a flag uh, since, since, you know, like is my timeout run out? Like, should I, should I consider the leader down? down? Uh, and uh, here I have just the meat. I mean, I'm not gonna go through all the code, just, just a few examples, but uh, after let's say the, the first, the first, uh, handler 
we're entering, uh, we're handling this message when we don't have a leader, we don't have a candidate, uh, and the heartbeat is false. This means that one of the nodes actually processed that handle continue call. So, and I don't know which node it is, but one of them actually got here. So in this, in this handler, I'm actually promoting myself to candidate and, and doing all these steps that I described, sending RPC calls to all the, uh, all the other nodes. Uh, once I get all the nodes, that's the second handler. Uh, the leader is set in the state um, and so on. We have the election timeout again. So I'm handling all these cases via uh, message sending uh, in, the, in the gen server. Uh, this is the vote request. So this, I, I will show you how I'm making those RPC requests. Actually, I should show you that first, sorry. Uh, distributed Erlang, I have all the nodes, right? If I know, if I run node list, I get a list of uh, addressable nodes and just uh, send an RPC call with a cast. I have my nodes and I have the method along with, uh, with the message who I'm voting for. Remember, I'm, I'm receiving this vote request first. Um, I'm not showing it here. But once, once I get that request from the leader, uh, I will uh, basically, I have the candidate in the state that I'm receiving and I'm, I'm just casting the vote for that leader. As you can see, I, I said voted for to the candidate and I set the term. So that's, that's how nodes kind of sync um, with the leader. Let's attempt a live demo. Let's see, I have this open here. So I use lip cluster. Like I said, like the, the, the way you, you handle the, the, the fleet is, is different and up to the implementation. So I'm gonna start three nodes here, A, B, and C. Hopefully the demo gods are good to me. So because I'm using lip cluster with uh, gossip, bam, I get everything connected, which is pretty awesome. And the demo guides are not nice. I get this sometimes, mostly, most likely because my message passing is not handled properly. Let's see. I said I will attempt this. So, if did if this didn't work, I still have the um, uh, the RabbitMQ one, which will work for sure. But here we can see we have two. Uh, the second term, uh, I'm guessing we ran into a split vote on the, the the previous one, but we actually elected a leader. It's a C. You can see it's. It's C everywhere. Uh, we have the number of votes, election timeout, which is random for each node. And that's about it. It's just, this is literally just the, um, uh, the leader election. So I found it. I found that it was a pretty nice way to understand what, what's going on. Uh, Rabbit in queue now. This is exciting. I, I was actually scared of Erlang and reading Erlang. So I, I read about the library and I kept trying to find something in Elixir. I did find a few, I couldn't make them work. Uh, and I finally decided to bite the bullet and, and just implement this, uh, implement it with, the, with RAW. So like I mentioned before, this is a, an example of a state machine. So they define a behavior uh, and our or module has to respond to init and apply. So init is pretty simple. That's our initial state. And our apply, we're defining here a write and a read. Super simple stuff. Just adding um, a key and reading, uh, adding a key value, reading the key. Uh, this is how we use it. Uh, we specify the state machine. Again, this. This is really awesome because it could be anything. Um, our arbitrary code that replicates on, on, on this distributed consensus cluster, which is, I think it's pretty awesome. 
here we have the server IDs. We're, we're, we're using like the first atom is the name. So we'll be able to call, if you can see when we process command, we, we just use a shortcut. We don't use the, the whole A at localhost. Uh, but that's about it. That's how we process the commands. And uh, I can quickly show this as well. So same thing. In here, I, I did not use any, um, ah, <laughs> my process is used by these guys. So in this case, I did not connect them with, with lib cluster. I just went for, so A, B, and C. I just went for pure distributed Erlang. Uh, just give them names. So now they're technically like they're sharing the same cookie because I'm running it from the same machine. But let's define this. I only have to do this in uh, on one node. I'm defining the machine. My machine is already in, in the project. So I'm gonna just initialize. We're getting back. We can see once we start the uh, the machine nodes. Basically getting back and okay, uh, the number of nodes that started, the number of nodes that didn't start. It's uh, also the implementations, the implementers responsibility to detect when nodes fail, like when nodes disconnect, trigger re-election. So this is, there's two components really. That's why I think libcluster and raft kind of play really nice together. But uh, we can see that we have zero servers that fail to start. We have a leader, it's A, and uh, we can see nodes started. These are all the nodes. And now I'm gonna attempt to write something to that state machine. So I wrote this, that's cool. I can read it. Oops. Can read the value i can read it on node b for example as well it's there you can write in node b sweet let's see i can read the same thing in here i'll read it on c just to make it more interesting uh, this is other key cool and like i said um we tolerate one node failure, so this still works. Uh, the moment we get one node though, we are toast. We are gonna time out. And again, if I reconnect those, I, I wish I could show that. I, I didn't code this uh, for this demo. If I reconnect them, they won't restart. You still have to handle that uh, yourself. Um, I think that's all I have. Uh, one, I was trying to figure out why, I mean, why would you use, uh, would you need uh, Raft in the Elixir Erlang ecosystem? And my main motivation was uh, it's, it's like usually it's very hard to run more than a hundred nodes, 60 to hundred uh, Elixir nodes because of the same problem that Raft has. Uh, you get an exponential amount of uh, network traffic for all these nodes talking to each other. So that is um, a very interesting topic. Uh, some people proposed using um, Raft to actually keep track of the state. So you have little Raft uh, clusters and instead of going through the typical distributed Erlang uh, RPC, you would actually ask a Raft cluster like, hey, who is, which nodes do you have in, in your cluster? And that, that would make it partition tolerant and uh, better, I guess. 